Bring a man to Seattle and anything's liable to happen. Yeah, I'll try. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit's long gone from here right now. Many fear what lies ahead and there tomorrow. But I know who holds tomorrow in his hand. It doesn't matter where he's leading you. Jesus will be there too. My Lord will help you. Just remember, Jesus cares. No need to worry about tomorrow. God's already there. Now I know what it's like to fear the future. make it through somehow and through the darkness I can hear my father say there's no need to worry about tomorrow cause I'm already there and I am waiting with open arms and your path I have prepared so when you feel you cannot go on just remember I still care, no need to worry about tomorrow, I'm already there. There's no need to worry about tomorrow, cause God's already there, and He is waiting with open arms, and your path He has prepared. So when just remember, Jesus cares. No need to worry about tomorrow. God's already there. There's no need to worry about tomorrow. God's already there. Praise the Lord. A savant. Yes. You said it nicely, so I'm not going to be offended. <laughs> I'm just going to try. I'm going I'm to submit to you on your knowledge of that word and whatever it means. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> I appreciate Brother Murphy letting me be here again this year. I want to say thank you to him. The staff have been a blessing. They just take care of everything and, and more than you need, and I appreciate that. And I do appreciate the shoes. Praise God, I did get some new shoes. Actually, I got a, a pair of shoes from the church. I got two pair of socks from somebody in the church that were kind of wild. I was started to wear them the night too, but I did not. And I got a set, another pair of shoes from somebody in the church with a card that said, in case they, you know, in case you need more help or something. I don't know what it really said, but they were covering for you, preacher, if you accidentally forgot again three times. They were covering for you. And so it's been a good trip for me on the footwear. I'm, I'm going to donate the pink ones. They're a little too big. And, uh, and I did not feel appropriate wearing them. So, and I think I may have pulled a muscle when I threw my leg up there on that. Got a little excited in the moment, you know, the adrenaline. And I thought, well, I may not get down, but the Lord has helped me. Praise the Lord for that. Some of you will remember, and some have even asked, and I appreciate that, about my nephew, son, Nico. I told a story last year about praying about that. He's lived with us since he was two. He's now seven, 
And last year, his biological mom, which is my wife's uh, sister, had decided she wanted to have him back. Some of you remember that story. Well, it worked out. We got to have him another year, which was a great blessing. Uh, but now it's another year. And so school's starting again. And uh, she has decided again she thinks he needs to come to Charlotte where she lives. And she lives a very, you know, a worldly life. And uh, she wants him to live there and go to public school. And so this week while I've been here, he has been at the Charlotte Public School. And her word to us is that I won't make him if he's miserable. I want him to be happy if he wants to live with you, which a seven-year-old shouldn't be making life decisions. But she has said that to us. He's called me last night in the middle of service. I, I ran out because he was trying to FaceTime me, and he was crying when I got out there. He's missing me, and, and uh, you know, I talked him down and calmed him down a little bit. So if you think of it, you pray. These next few days will be a big deal. Uh, I just if He wants to be with us, and if she'll hold to her word, then he'll be back with us in a few days. Uh, and I feel like that we'll have a little bit of leverage if, if it goes that way. So the Lord's been trying to help me this week. It seemed like all the messages uh, have been uh, a help to me in that area and different things. And even uh, some verses the Lord's been giving me this week about trusting in Him. So I'm trying to do that. And I appreciate those of you that have asked. And so if you just keep praying. His name's Nico, N-E-K-O. And if you'd keep praying for that, that'd be a blessing. And if I get good news, I'll try and remember and uh, let you know, preacher, so you can tell them. All right. Good to have the Randolphs. Brother Wayne's a friend of mine and out of our church and planted a church last November when we technically started it over in Covington here in uh, the state of Washington. And so I'm glad to see them tonight and praise the Lord they're able to be here. First Corinthians chapter 15, I heard a story just the, uh, I believe it was today, I heard it actually said that this man decided he wanted to join the convent. He wanted to join, uh, you know, he wanted to just get away from everything and, and go join one of these convent deals. And they said, well, in order to be a part of this one, you have to take a vow of silence for 10 years. Now, the first vow of silence for 10 minutes and I'm out. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, <laughs> I'm not gifted in silence. I have a hard time with silence. Are you, are you like that too, preacher? Go ahead and say amen. 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 I don't know. But if I'd have said that at our church, they would have all said amen. All right. My wife would have run a lap shouting. Uh, and so he, he, he had to take that vow of silence. They said, you got to do it for 10 years. So he went 10 years. He made it. At the end of 10 years, they said, you can say two words. And he goes like this. He goes, food bad. <laughs> the food in the place is obviously not too good. And they said, well, you got 10 more years. You got to try it again. So he goes 10 more years. 10 more years. Said, you got two words. He goes, bed hard. They said, okay. Ten more years. After that last ten years, they said, you got two words. He said, I quit. <laughs> you know what they said? Well, that's good because you ain't done nothing but complain since you've been here. <laughs> so, we'll try not to complain. Let's just jump right in. As Brother Fisher said, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. I really have a uh, Two messages mixed into one. I have no idea how it's going to go. But it's kind of like the other night when I wanted to get to the end. And I feel that way again tonight. I want to get to the last thought and share it particularly with uh, the church here. And, uh, brother, I had a bottle of water laying right there. And it was, a, yeah, an adult-sized bottle. That'll be good. <laughs> Instead of these miniatures that you give the preachers here. Mm. I'm a big boy in pink shoes, man. You got to have some water. You got to have some water. Verse 57. Let's all stand just for the reading, just to make sure you're good and awake, get your legs to work. And but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, through, Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's look at that verse again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the, what's that word? Work, work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your, say it, Labor is not in vain in the Lord. Heavenly Father, help me now over the next few minutes to be a blessing to this good church. Lord, what a help this meeting has been to me, even in this area of my son and all that's going on there at home. Lord, how the, you have used this place to encourage me and you've used the messages and, and the different things going on to help me. So I pray that you would return the favor now. Use me to be a blessing to them in these next few minutes and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, 
All right, you can be seated. That's going to be a little bit different kind of message tonight, and I want to go ahead and apologize uh, to any of the visitors that are here. And certainly the truths that I'm going to try to share would help the visitors, but I want to preach for a few minutes primarily to the folks of Open Door. And, uh, and so I know we got some visitors still here for the meeting. Obviously, I've just mentioned Brother Wayne and them, and they're visiting, but uh, I want to preach from my heart just a couple of minutes, and particularly at the end, to this church. You know, Proverbs 27, verse 2 says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth. A stranger are not thine own lips. And I want to do a certain measure of that for a few minutes tonight. Now, I don't want to praise anybody for the purpose of puffing them up. We don't want to get full of pride, and hopefully we all understand that anything good that ever happens through us is because of the Lord. But what I want to do is try to use it to encourage you by pointing out to you some of what God has been doing and some of what God is doing and is continuing to do, listen to me, church, to use you and use this church and particularly this meeting. Now we have a camp meeting coming up in about, I don't know, a month or so and a little over a month and we do leadership things in the mornings and, and so I understand a little bit about putting on a meeting like this and you know, sometimes there are people in the church and they, they just kind of they kind of look at it sideways when you start bringing the preachers in and putting them up and giving them shoes and doing things like that and they don't fully grasp sometimes what the Lord's trying to do through a church. Brother Fisher told me a long time ago about our church he said, Brother Tony, he said there are he said all churches are churches for people. In other words, every church is supposed to try and reach the people and it's community and be a blessing to the people in its community. He said, but God has it planned for some churches to also be a church for other churches. He said that they are not only reaching their community, but that God is going to use them to be a blessing to other churches in their community and even beyond that. And uh, he was kind of challenging me that in our region, maybe our church would be that. And so we have our camp meeting and we kind of do it that way. We try to bring guys in and be a blessing to preachers and their wives and so on and so forth. And that's what you've been doing here. And maybe sometimes you look at it and think, I, I don't know, should we do it like that or, or, or is it all worth it? And so I want to encourage you a little bit tonight uh, with some things. The two words that I focus in on there in verse 58 are the two words that come to my mind when you start thinking about putting on a meeting like you have put on this week. And that's the words work and labor. See, I know there's an unbelievable amount of work that has already been done before we ever even got here. I understand that there was work going on, probably some special cleaning days and special work days to get the property right and special prayer meetings and probably some fasting and all these different things, not to mention the organization. He talked about the choir. No doubt how many times they gathered together when nobody else was getting together. They were getting together to practice and, and so on and so forth. So there's an unbelievable amount of work that's already been done and then that's been done in the week this week and will even be done tonight. I know we're not finished tonight. You have church tomorrow night, but uh, there will still be work done tonight. And, and every night, I, I've stayed late, pretty late each night. But, you know, every time I've left, there was open door still working. The open door folks were still here. When all of us visitors were going back to the hotel, the, the open door folks were still here laboring. And so the word work and the word labor certainly applies to a meeting like this. And, and here's what I also understand, church. Listen, that many of you have been involved in things that I didn't even see that maybe nobody saw. And here, this is a sad truth, is that, that some of you or a lot of you were involved in some things that because nobody saw it, maybe nobody's going to thank you. Now, it shouldn't be that way, but it just happens. Things, things get through the cracks and, and, and things happen and, and we're up here running the service and the preacher's running wild, trying to keep the order of the service right and everything else. And sometimes we can forget all of the many things that are having to be done at the same time. And perhaps we don't go to everyone and say, thank you, we'll try to say it from the pulpit. But maybe we don't get to you. Maybe no visitor said to you, thank you for what you did. And you're doing some things that perhaps you'll receive no credit and perhaps you'll receive no glory or uh, nobody necessarily thanking you. And so tonight, I want to emphasize something to you here at the end of the verse. He says, I want you to know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. And that's what I want to say to you tonight, church. Uh, maybe nobody has said thank you, but that doesn't mean your labor was in vain for the Lord. It was not. God is not going to miss, and I'm going to get to that at the end, what you did in this work of this week. And so uh, I want you to know that sometimes we get weary in well-doing, and we get wore out and physically tired and mentally tired and spiritually tired. And I want to say something else, that I get grieved about this for our own people. But sometimes we have the camp meeting, and we bring all these guys in, and, and we got the preachers in, and we got the visiting singers in. And I look at some of my best folks, and they don't hardly even get to come. 
And we're all getting this spiritual help and man, we're getting the blessings and we're crying and we're shouting and we're getting uh, refreshed and, and I've got people uh, cooking and, and they don't hardly, I've got ladies in the nursery don't hardly get to come to a service. Where's their spiritual refreshment, you see? And so we can get weary and well-doing if we're not careful. And many of you are tired right now and you haven't been able to attend because of your serving. And I know that the meeting's not over, but everybody, uh, let me just say on behalf of everybody that's been here already this week and everybody that's been here in the past at this meeting and everybody that might even come in for tomorrow night, I want to say thank you from all of them. And I want to say, look here, it's not in vain. Yeah, but I didn't see. Listen, we don't always see. I'm telling you, as an outsider, as somebody, that's been, as somebody that needed some help this week, you didn't have any idea what's going on in our life. You didn't know uh, kind of what's going on in my mind with my son and that whole day. You didn't know last night when I walked out that my boy was going to be crying on the other side of that phone. And then I was going to come back in here. And you know what I was going to need? I needed the Lord when I came back in here. But you didn't know that. And I'll tell you something, you don't know that about all of these folks that have been here this week. You have no idea. One year, I had a guy on my heart, and, and I just, uh, the Lord, now I know the Lord put him on my heart. And I reached out to his son who was coming to our meeting, and he was maybe somewhere down south living at the time. And I knew he was coming, and his brother was coming, and their dad pastored in West Virginia. So I called the boy, and I said, man, I'm thinking about inviting your dad for y'all could kind of meet up. I know you don't get to see each other as much. And so I called his dad. And I said, man, I'd like to invite you to our camp meeting. And if you can get here, we'll pay for your hotel. And, and they'll feed you while you're here. And hopefully it won't hardly cost you anything. Maybe it'll be a blessing. Your boys are coming. And he just said, preacher, I believe that'll be good. Thank you. So he comes to the meeting. The Lord blessed and he got some help. But I didn't know until uh, like a year or so later that he had just been thrown out of his church. Including his house. Like the next day he had to get out of the parsonage. No money, didn't know what he was going to do. Here's what he told me. He said, I was done. He said, I was going to move to where my boys lived and get a job. I was done in the ministry. He said, we didn't even know what we was going to do. He said, when you called, he said, I thought, well, I can't go to that meeting. I can't even afford to. He said, then you said y'all would pay for it. He said, so we just came. And he said, he said, preacher, you have no idea what God did for us in that meeting. And you know, that's the truth. In the meeting, I had no idea. But aren't you glad God had an idea? And let me tell you this, I'm glad we had the meeting. I'm glad we offered to pay for that preacher's room. He wouldn't have come. He may have. I'm not bragging on us. It's all God. I didn't have no idea. What I'm saying is it was not in vain. Hey, whoever gave a little money in the offering and allowed us to pay for that preacher's room, you reckon they got something in heaven for that? I guarantee you. Hey, he went on and pastored another church and has been doing very well. And maybe because of that meeting's why he didn't quit. And so it's not in vain. You don't see everything that God is doing in a meeting like this. But I'm telling you, it's not in vain. Thank you for what you're doing. There are things going on. Turn to Acts chapter one, a very familiar verse. Almost everybody could quote it. I want to just rattle off a couple of things that happens in a meeting, this meeting and meetings like it, that, that maybe you don't know and that will encourage you and then give you a thought right at the very end. First of all, influence. The meeting like this becomes about influence. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, everybody knows the verse. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. You know, this is the key to the Christian life right here, influence. The key to the Christian life is not in titles. It's not in, you know, uh, if I'm the pastor or assistant pastor or a staff member. It's about lives. It's about how many people am I touching for the cause of Christ? H how much influence do I have? And sometimes uh, young fellows who get their self messed up, they'll be in a place where they're under somebody else, but they have influence over hundreds of people in that position. But because they're not the pastor, uh, they just got it burning in them. I got to be that. I got to be, I got to be in that spot. And they'll leave that place of influence over hundreds where they're the second man and force themselves into a place over here where they might be pastor, but only touching 20 lives. What they don't understand is it's about influence. It's about touching lives. And you know, and, and according to this verse, it looks like that, that every local church is expected to touch lives in all the areas of the world, in your own county, in your own state, in your own country, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, this meeting increases your influence. How many years have you been doing this meeting, preacher, like this? Nine. Nine years. Do you understand that the influence of Open Door Baptist Church has increased in the last nine years because y'all do this meeting? Yeah, this Acts 1-8, fulfilling this Great Commission verse here, you're closer to fulfilling this verse than you were nine years ago because of this meeting. For example, there's a little place over on the other side called Mary, North Carolina. I'd never heard of Open Door Baptist Church. We met, I guess, or at least 
you saw me at Brother Fisher's or whatever. And so Brother Fisher has a meeting like this and, and it spreads his influence and then all of a sudden I go out there and preach and my influence spreads and touch Brother Murphy and then he brings me here and all of a sudden, I, I'm going to be honest with you, the first year I came here, well, I guess two years ago, I didn't have any idea what to expect from you people. <laughs> Little did I know, these years later, I'd be wearing pink shoes on the platform. <laughs> I, glad I didn't know that maybe, praise the Lord. But let's be honest, you didn't know what to expect from the hillbilly that was coming. I didn't know what to expect from Seattle, you know. I don't know if you know this, but it's, some people don't know what to expect from Seattle. I'm just going to leave it right there. I thought there was a chance we'd be hugging trees and <laughs> spotted owls. and Y'all remember that first year I started telling stories about walking out the woods and chopping down trees and killing things. Then I went, oh, wait, I don't know. <laughs> I had a guy come up to me after and said, that's all right, preacher. We like all that too around here. I said, good, good. We didn't have any idea. I didn't know anything about this place. You know what I left that first year? I left so stirred. And the first night you put those guys on the platform and there was a banjo in the group. Yep. Oh, help us. <laughs> I said, there is a remnant right there. <laughs> For real though, I left that meeting with the word remnant on my heart. You know what I said? I said, Lord, I, I said, I'm sorry for how my mind works sometimes and how we think that you're, you're located in only certain parts of the world. And I left so encouraged that over here in Seattle, Washington, there's a remnant, not just of evangelicals, no, a remnant of Bible-believing Christians that like all the same things I like. I left here, so you know what it was? Your influence spread. I went back, and you know what I started doing? I started talking about it. And I started preaching some about hope in America. And one of the best reasons I had hope in America was because there's a remnant. And it said about uh, the children of Israel, said, except he had left for us a very small remnant, we would have been like as Sodom and like as unto Gomorrah. And God spared those, their land because of a very small remnant. Man, I started saying, hey, I'm telling you, there's a remnant still here. And I would say, I've been to such and such place. And I've been to this place. And I'd say, hey, I was just over in Seattle. And there's a church over there. And they love the Bible. And they love God. You know, what that was? That was your influence spreading because of this meeting. Not just your influence. Listen to me. This meeting expands others' influence. People have heard me preach. The influence of New Man Baptist Church in Mary, North Carolina has reached people now that it never would have reached before because you hosted this meeting. Most of the preaching that I do, particularly on this side of the country, is because Brother Fisher has had me preach at his church in a meeting just like this. My influence, our church's ability to fulfill Acts 1-8 has been helped because of his meeting. And, and my ability to fulfill this verse in my own life and our church's ability, hey, has been helped by this meeting. It's not in vain what you're doing. You say, but I didn't preach, I didn't sing. Hey, it's not all about that. God sees it all. And we're going to all, listen, I'm going to have a better judgment seat of Christ because you had this meeting. Praise the Lord for you. Hey, all these preachers, uh, Brother Shemesh, I wonder, I wonder how many places Brother Shemesh has preached because you and he started bringing him to this meeting. Right. True. I wonder if he's been in some other conferences because the preacher heard him here. And now the ministry that Brother Joe and them have there in Thailand, uh, more people are finding out about it and their influence is spreading, which is what Acts 1-8 says for it to do. And it's doing it because you have this meeting. Hey, it's doing it because you stood at the door and did your job. It's doing it because you worked in the nursery. It's doing it because you prepared the food. You say, no, yes, God sees it all. Yes, sir. And so influence becomes a big deal. But not only that, hey, listen, introductions, Acts chapter 18, we're not going to turn there, but in Acts 18, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla. It's a divine appointment. Absolute divine appointment. They, they work in the same uh, craft as he does, as tent makers. And listen, and they become lifelong assets in the ministry for Paul. It was no accident they met. God helped them meet because God knew they would be a help in his ministry. And I want you to know something. Meetings like this are all about that right there. Connections are made, listen, that increase God's work for eternity at a place like this. When you are willing to pay for the food and so instead of going out and eat, you paid the money or some of you cooked the food and preachers go down and they just sit at a table. And last night, we've been looking at some things at our church and, and uh, I'm not the greatest in technology and we're behind the times and all that stuff. And, and I sat down with a guy last night at the table, just an empty table. It wasn't one of the visiting preachers. It wasn't anybody that I knew. It was just a young man and a very old man. And if you're in here, very old man, I apologize if that offends you. <laughs> but he said he was 90. 
See, there you go. And so that qualifies, right? Okay. Started talking to the other young guy, and he works. It's Todd. His name's Todd. I don't know if Todd's sitting in here. Todd works for push pay. And, and we've been looking for years about how to get something like that. And I just talked to him, hey, where do you live? How long have you been going to church here? What do you do? He started telling me what he does. And I said, you, now tell me about that. Before it's over, man, he's on the job. Like, I'm like, I worked him all night last night. I wrote things down. I've got his name. I've got his number. I'm going back to get with my staff guy that might handle that and connect him with Todd. And you say, what that, what's that going to do? I think it's going to help our church. Good. And you know how it happened? Because y'all fed us. Yeah. Yeah. I would never have spoken to Todd in here. Right. Todd would never have been able to tell me where he works in the service. But because you're willing to feed us. Yeah. See, you don't see what God does. And... I'm, I'm just telling you, it's huge. The introductions, the connections that God will give us. It said in 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. They ended up having a church in their house and it's because God connected them supernaturally. And God does that at this meeting. Every year, no doubt, divine appointments take place in the meeting. I'm talking about people who have a great impact on one another's lives and ministries. If you've ever heard Brother Fisher tell the story about he and Brother Shemish, it was in a McDonald's after a, a night service the previous night in Australia. And uh, Brother Fisher had preached and sat down and started talking to him. And Brother Shemish, you know, I don't know if y'all know this, but social skills are not necessarily his <laughs> greatest strength or Brother Fisher's. I'd, just to be honest with you, I would have loved to sit and watch that awkwardness right off the bat. <laughs> Come on. The two of them trying to break the ice. That's when he needed Brother Shirley. Brother Shirley, come tell us a joke over here. <laughs> you know what it was? How many of us know now, knowing the history of how God's used the two of them in each other's ministries, that that was no accidental. That was her hap, as he said earlier, was to be on that field. And I'm telling you, that happens at your meeting. I met Charlie Clark at Brother Fisher's first meeting, and uh, the Lord, he, he, you, you talk about an odd couple. Brother Charlie is a Yankee of Yankees, New Jersey. He looks like a little Ken doll. He's always perfectly cropped. And I told her, I said, I know you sleep like that. They open the box in the morning and pull you out. And I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. And then I'm his buddy. He calls me. He says, Hillbilly. That's what he says when he calls me. You know what? We connected at that. He's preached our youth rally for, I think, like 15 years now. I preach their tent meeting now about every year. I've got people going to their Bible college. A young man left today, one of our best young men. You know how that happened? Because Brother Fisher and him held a meeting like this one. And in that meeting, we, we got to meet divine appointments. I went to a meeting in Dillon, Montana, and, and uh, it's not just exactly like this, but, you know, it's similar in some ways. And you that know Dillon, you know. But uh, sitting at the table, eating, met a big guy, big old strong-looking guy, started talking to him. He said, we're missionaries, we're going to Wales. His name is B.J. Stagner. So I just start talking to him. I said, hey, man. Turns out he was from North Carolina, had been in North Carolina, was pastor in Tennessee. Now he's going to the Wales, to the mission field. We kind of just hit it off, had a good spirit. I liked his spirit. We connected. I said something like, listen, let me know. You can come by sometime if you're ever back over there. He comes by our church. And, man, our church just fell in love with him. The short of it is uh, two years ago, we took 60 people to Wales wow. on a mission trip. Wow. I mean, it, you say, how'd that happen? Because somebody had a meeting like yours, and we were sitting at the table, and the Lord said, mm -hmm. he had us sit together. And, and listen, I'm telling you, that's going to have eternal value. Yes, Brother Sturgeon's church and those ladies that cook and serve, they're going to get eternal value. Right. It's, good. it's not in vain. Right. The, the influence, the, the uh, introductions, and the inspiration... And then I want to get to Exodus chapter 8. Go ahead and turn there. See, people come to this meeting and they see how you serve. And they see how good you are to these visiting folks and they get inspired to do it. We've been having camp meeting for years and years and we've been bringing folks in and trying to put them up and take care of them. But I'd never seen anybody give the visiting guys books with $50 bill markers or $100 bill markers. It was $100, wasn't it? Yeah, mine's always $50. <laughs> You about made me spit my water right there. <laughs> and so I'd never seen that. And I thought, man, that is great. What a great idea. A lot of those guys, you know, they come because they just need to come. Sure. Sure. I mean, they just need to get away, 
They need refreshing. And you know, a lot of them, they can't afford it. And they just come anyway because they know we're going to pay for the room. And, and you know what? I, I never even thought about, man, just some spending money while they're there. Yep. So you know what we did last year? We gave them all books with money in them. No, no, Brother Kurt's book. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wasn't his the thinner book? I can't remember. One of them was thinner. Yours the thinner one? Then I would have gave that one. Which one's got more pictures? That would have been good for me. No, I'm sorry. Look, you ruined it. And who's doing the preaching right now? Goodness gracious. You know why we did that? And you, you think it wasn't a blessing? And you say, well, that wasn't us. No, in heaven it was. Heaven's tracking this whole thing. Heaven's tracking it all. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. And so heaven was watching those guys in our meeting last year who were opening that book. And it was, man, it was just what they and their wife needed. And heaven's going, well, I'm glad he went to Murphy's meeting. I'm glad Brother Murphy's people let him give that money to those preachers. It's inspiration. Exodus chapter 8, I want to show you a truth about God in closing right here to encourage you in what you're doing. It's not in vain. It's not in vain. Exodus chapter 8, verse 20. We're in the plagues here. and The Bible said, The Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water. Say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, upon thy servants and upon thy people, and into thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms, and also the ground whereon they lay. Verse 24. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into the, his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. And the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Verse 28. Pharaoh said, I'll let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness only. You shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. Many of you have heard that preach that there were three compromises that Pharaoh offered. And this is one of those. He said, okay, I'll let you go. Just don't go very far. But look what verse 29 says. And Moses said, behold, I go out from thee and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. Now look at this. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Everybody read the last part of the verse with me. Ready? Begin. There remained not... Now isn't that interesting? Now I don't know. Maybe out here in Seattle you don't have flies. But I grew up in Kentucky. and We have a lot of flies in Kentucky. All right? I grew up in a house where we didn't have a lot of money. My dad, you heard the testimony, was a drunk for 25 years. And so we lived in some rough, you know, situations sometimes. And so didn't always have air conditioning and stuff. So you'd have screens. You know, you'd open the windows, but you'd have screens. But those of you that ever did like that know that sometimes the screens get holes in them or they get popped out. You got three boys running around. They're breaking screens and things. And flies start getting in. And flies will drive you crazy. And if you kill one, like four come to its funeral, it's hard. <laughs> Am I right? Have you ever been trying to sleep and have one on you? Man, I've knocked myself almost out before. <laughs> trying to God, kill that fly. In the, it was crazy in the little country stores there. where, And I say country store, it's got everything. It's got hardware. It's got tools. It's got a little place where you can get food. You know, the people will come literally right out of the field, come in for lunch. And they get a, they get a thick bologna sandwich on crackers and hot sauce. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, yeah, somebody done said amen over here. And, uh, but what always kind of got my attention was those sticky things hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Y'all know, how many of you know what I'm talking about? And uh, it's right near where you make the food. And you say, what's on the sticky thing? About a thousand dead flies. <laughs> it is. I thought that is the worst idea in the history of the world for a place where you're preparing food. I guess it's better than the live flies being on your food, but I just always remember as a boy looking at that thinking, man, that's gross. <laughs> Give me some food. I didn't care, you know. But if you've ever dealt with flies, I mean, it's unbelievable. And this was, I mean, this had to be millions of flies. To be, and the Bible said, I believe in verse 24, it was in all the land of Egypt. And so I picture it literally like a dark cloud. I mean, that when they came in, that people noticed they were coming in. It wasn't just, oh, I got a fly on me. I mean, grievous is what the Bible said, swarm of flies. And so like a dark cloud, millions of flies come in and they take over this land. Now, I would dare say 
that there were some flies in Egypt before this. Wouldn't you agree? They had livestock. We know that. And if you've got livestock, you've got some flies. And so it's not like there were no flies there before. It's that God brought a plague of flies. So what's interesting is God, when it's time to answer the prayer, says all flies are out. And it says there remain not one. Now, the Holy Spirit wrote that for a reason. Now, I don't know all of why maybe God chased out the very last fly. I would say that some of them were saying, but God, we were already living here before you did this. Why do we got to leave? Just run off all the new flies you brought in. And God said, nope, everybody's out. All of you. There remain not one. I think one of the reasons God did that is because he didn't want anybody to be able to say he didn't keep his word, first of all. When he says, I'll remove them, somebody might say, oh, he didn't get them all. And so God says, uh, we're not going to let anybody say I don't keep my word, so I'll get them all out. But here's what has my attention on that for this closing thought, is that we preach and we're so excited about the truth of God's bigness, and I am. I'm glad that through the Bible we just heard some about the story of David, and I'm thankful we don't only see it in the story of David, but all through the Word of God we see that our God is so big and, and so strong and so mighty. The children's song we teach the kids on the buses is that there's nothing our God cannot do. And I'm glad that we know we have a God so big that there's not any giant that can come in our life. There's not one problem that can rise up in our life that our God is not big enough to handle. Isn't that a great truth? But I want you to see right here that that great big cosmic giant God is also when he needs to be a God of the details. I mean, he chased out the last. Moses didn't chase them out. God removed the very last fly from Egypt. Sister, if you go ahead and come to the piano or whoever's going to come for the invitation time, just start playing. That great and mighty and powerful God focused all the way down to get the very last one of those millions of flies out. So he's a God of the details when he needs to be. You say, why is that important? Well, one very general reason is there's 7 billion people on this planet. And in those 7 billion, I'm not a very big deal. But I'm glad he sees me. I'm glad he can focus in on me. Just one. But there are three things when it becomes very important that he's a God of the details. I'll rattle them off because I want to get to the very last one. One, in cleansing our sins in redemption, it's very good that He's a God of the details. Because if He missed just one sin, I'd have to go to hell. If He only cleansed my big sins, see, then the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire. And if He missed, brother, if He missed one little lie, I'd have had to go to hell. Aren't you glad He didn't? My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. That our God, that great, big, giant, powerful God, when it was time to save me from my sins, I was seven years old. He got all the ones I had done. He got what was going on. And then he looked forward and got every one and washed it away in the blood of Jesus. I'm glad he can focus on the details for that. Listen to this. When claiming the saints in the rapture, He's going to be a God of the details too. He's not just going to come and get the big shot Christians. He's not just going to come and get the ones whose name's on a sign. No, no, no. You know what the world's going to say after he comes to get us? There remain not one. He's not going to miss one. My little mom and daddy back in Kentucky, they live in a, their house burned. Our house we grew up in burned down many years ago. Some churches in the community and people got together and helped them get some things. They actually bought two single wide trailers and my dad fastened them together. So it's a full blown redneck double wide. That's what it is. <laughs> Build a roof over it. You couldn't hardly tell it now if you were looking, but that's what it is. They live in that thing, man. Mama's got all this antique stuff, you know, and she just loves it. And if I wasn't here preaching, none of y'all would ever, ever know who they are. And you still don't know. They call them Gurney and Peepaw. That's what we call them, Gurney and Peepaw. Because the first grandson couldn't, couldn't say granny or anything normal. And the first grandkid gets the name. Y'all know how that works. The first grandkid picks the names. And so somehow he said Gurney, probably just burped or something, and they thought he said Gurney. <laughs> and so it becomes Gurney and Peepaw forever and ever. 
And to this world, they, they mean nothing. You know, you're, you're probably never going to see them. But if Jesus were to come tonight, if he were to come in the rapture tonight, he'd take me right off this platform, bless his holy name. And he'd go to North Carolina where my wife is and my children, he'd take them. But you know what? In the midst of getting all them, he'd find that little makeshift double wide that nobody knows anything about in the back hills of Kentucky. He ain't going to get my mom and daddy and they're not going to get left. You know why? Because he sees it all. He's not going to miss one. But the real reason I told you this message was this last all. Not only in cleansing our sins and redemption and claiming as saints in the rapture, but when considering our service for rewards. And this is what I want to say to you, open door. Hebrews says in 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. I want you to know that God has seen everything you've done this week. If nobody else even... Listen, if you did something you wasn't even asked to do just because you saw it needed to be done, God saw it. And God don't look at things the way the world does. See, when this meeting ends, we're going to go away, many of us, and we're going to be talking about Brother Fisher. And we're going to be talking about Brother Skelly and, and the choir and the things that were up here. And if we're not careful, we get kind of just like the world and all the credit gets heaped up on the platform. But I got news for you, Christian. God in heaven is not like that. He's not impressed that my name is on the flyer. And he's not up in heaven giving me big score because my name was on the flyer. See, our God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. And here's what some of you did this week. Some of you this week, for, you, you forgave your spot in the service and went and worked in the nursery. That's the front lines, by the way. I've walked by the nursery sometime and, and thought, my goodness, there's a war going on in there. And I just slowly claw my way, praise God. But you know, you say, yeah, nobody cares. Nobody, uh, the parents don't even thank us. But you know what probably happened this week? There was probably some preacher and his wife that came this week. And at their church, she does everything. And she misses church all the time to work the nursery at their church. Do you understand? She don't get to hear her husband preach a whole lot because she's either doing the nursery or she's out counseling and they don't have a lot of staff yet. They don't have a lot of help yet. And man, they get tired and they get weary. And she's got her own children. And when she's not in the nursery, she's got her own kids. And she's having to take one of them out. And, and she came to this meeting not even knowing if she'd even be able to hardly sit in here. And then when she got here, they said, hey, we got a nursery. We'll take, we'll take him. He's running around her like a Tasmanian devil, son. And they said, we can take him in the nursery. Well, he's a little wild. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. And she got to come in. A little nervous, got that little shaking thing in her hand, hoping it don't go off. <laughs> and she sits by her husband. Can I just testify and tell you how much my wife likes it when we're in a place and I get to sit in church by her? Because it never happens. And I'll just sit by her sometimes and she'll just reach and grab my hand. And that little lady got to come in and sit by her husband in the services this week. And God began to minister in her heart. Speaking through the preachers and the choir. And he started stirring her. And he started restoring joy and hope in her heart. And she started thinking, yeah, I'm glad we serve God. And somewhere throughout the week, she starts thinking, I can't wait to get back. Boy, I like how they do the nursery. Oh, I like how they did that. And man, I believe we could do that. And listen, now, when it was all said and done, that little lady, even herself, she even herself may go back and say, Brother Fisher's message was such a blessing. Oh, it was just what I needed. And it was, and I'm not minimizing our part. But heaven is paying attention to other stuff. And what I want you to know, Open Door, is that heaven will certainly give Brother Fisher his credit for having preached something to help that lady. But heaven is also writing down the names of the ladies who were down there wrestling that Tasmanian devil. Because heaven knows that woman would never have been able to hear any of it if they hadn't been there. She'd have never heard one word of the message she had to have had it not been for the servants down there that nobody has thanked and that thinks nobody cares. But I'm telling you, heaven cares. And our God that chased the very last fly out of Egypt, He has noticed every last piece of labor you've done. 
and he's given credit. I used to be a bus captain. I'm almost done. Probably. I mean, she is playing. When I was a bus captain, I had a lady in our church that used to make brownies for our bus route. And she'd make them in the morning where they were warm. And you say, well, breakfast? That's right. Amen. It's milk and eggs and, you know. She got, uh, she got upset at me. And she got upset at the church. I don't remember what all happened, but I think it was more of the school deal. And she decided she wasn't doing it no more. She didn't even come to church and she still don't like me very much. Or at all, just to be honest with you. But she had a teenage daughter living at that house that I had been her youth pastor and been her teacher and principal and now she's worked for us for many years, that teenage girl. You know what that teenage girl started doing? She said, Mr. Shirley, that's what she called me. I was her principal. I wasn't the pastor at the time. She said, Mr. Shirley, I'll do it. I'll make the brownies for y'all. And that teenage girl would get up on Sunday before everybody else and she wouldn't make them on Saturday night because she knew. She knew we liked them warm. She'd hang them in a little plastic bag and uh, I, the kids would get on the bus. They'd say, we have having brownies today? I'd say, I hope so. And we'd see them hanging on the door. We got to their house and we'd run over and get them. We'd start passing them out. Do you know they would bring friends sometimes and the friends would say, we have brownies on this bus? I'd say, yes, we do. Wait till we get over to their house. We'd get it. I wonder if there was ever a kid that came because their buddy said, we eat brownies for breakfast on our bus. Now we would have biscuits too, but you got brownies, you know. And they might come, you know a lot of kids don't get decent food sometimes and they'll come on the bus because they get some food. And they maybe just come for the games and the brownie. I don't think you ought to bribe them. Well, don't bribe them and they won't ride your bus, okay? <laughs> But I bet you there were some kids, Brother Murphy, that rode the bus because their friends said, you ain't going to believe what we do. And there's this lady, and she makes us warm brownies. And when we get them, they're still hot. They're in these little bags. And, and, and they said, won't you come? And they'd ride that bus for that brownie. But you know, that's not all they do. Then they go sit in junior church. And then they go to junior church, and there's a guy gets up, and he opens that King James Bible, and he starts preaching. Amen. And then sometimes that one that came for the brownie hears the preaching, and they get under conviction, and they go forward, and they get saved. And listen, and they made their whole life run around saying, oh, I remember what happened. I was sitting in that junior church. And they might say something like this, Brother Tony's bus, Brother Tony's bus came and got us. And Brother Tony was the bus captain. And, and old Brother So-and-so preached in junior church. And man, I went forward and got saved. And I thank God for Brother Tony. And I thank God for the junior church preacher. But you know what heaven was doing? Hey, heaven was saying, Meredith made the brownies. And he might never have come if she wasn't getting up before everybody else just so they'd be warm. Amen. Because our great big old God, He sees every little thing you do for Him. Amen. And it's not in vain. Amen. Last story. When I first became pastor, I heard a thing called the pastor's prayer team a guy did, and I wanted to put one of them together. And one of the deals of the pastor's prayer team was anybody that signed up to be on it had to commit to pray 10 minutes for each service just for the pastor. Just for me, for that service, I had to pray 10 minutes. Well, I was still running the bus at those days. And so I was pastoring and also bus captain. And, and the way they built our church, and before you get all critical, I didn't build the church. But the baptistry is under the platform. So we have a lid. We have to remove that. So we don't baptize all the time. We do it every few months. We schedule it. We say we're going to have one. We have it. So I had a plumber in a church, a good old boy, not very spiritual. I never heard him testify. I've never heard him. I've never heard him. He don't preach. You would not consider him. His name's John. You wouldn't consider him very spiritual. Just a good old boy. But John had been a plumber by trade. And so he would, he would open it up and run the water, make sure the heat was on. Because one time we about killed some children with a, a absolutely freezing mountain water. And uh, so he would make sure the heat was on. He'd get the baptistry ready for me. So I, I come running off the bus route one Sunday afternoon. We was having a baptism at night. I told my boy that helped me on the bus route, let's run in, make sure the baptistry's ready right before we go home. So I come running in, and, and John was down here messing with something under the platform. Now, he was a, a little bit of a jack-of-all-trades. I just assumed he was fixing something, some wire or some screw that was loose or whatever. I didn't even speak to him. I just went right on up to the baptistry, start cleaning it a little bit, messing around with it. In just a minute, John steps forward, and he says, Hey, preacher, what y'all doing? I said, I oh, was just cleaning up. I looked at him. He looked a little red in his eyes. I said, uh, Brother John, what's going on? I said, Were you praying? He said this, he said, I was just getting my 10 minutes in for you, preacher. And so he was on his knees in my spot, up in there saying, God, help him. God, touch him tonight when he preaches. 
fill him with the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't know what I preached that night. But if anything good happened, if somebody come up after the service and shook my hand and said, Brother Shirley, boy, that was just what we needed. Oh, thank you, Brother Shirley. I don't know how you do it, but man, God gave you the exact words. And they would go home and they'd be thankful for Brother Shirley. But heaven's up there going. No, it was John. He, he said, heaven saying, it wasn't Shirley, it was John. It was John and all them other ones that were somewhere that day for 10 minutes saying, oh God, bless him. Now y'all know I'm crazy and you've only known me a little bit. They know I'm crazy. I preached 40 minutes tonight. And they were saying, God, you're going to have to use that crazy guy because he's all we got. And heaven's up there keeping a record of every one of them. Because our God is a God of the details too. And whatever you did this week, I'm telling you, is not in vain. And all of them things that I said happens, happened again this week and probably will happen tomorrow. And you that did anything, Heaven's going, yeah. It's because she stayed and picked up the trash. and It's because he helped straighten up the parking. And he, she done this and he done that. And maybe we didn't see you and I'm sorry. I'm sorry if we didn't thank you. But don't think it didn't matter. <laughs> because God sees it. And maybe some of you pastors that are here still, let's all stand. Maybe you're thinking, I just don't have a church like this. Boy, I wish I did. I don't have as many people I wish I did. I want you to know that great big old God sees what you're doing. And it matters to Him. And He's not missing it. You say, well, what kind of invitation do we have? Well, we have, we have a couple of things. One, we can come and thank God for what He does and what He has done and that He lets us have a part. And then if you've been a little discouraged, you can come and say, Lord, help me to keep on keeping on doing my part because I know you're looking. Preacher, you come.